Uh, so I'm Marine Franck from uh, the UN Organization for Refugees and um, I am Program Officer on Climate Change and Disaster Displacement. So uh, climate change is a cause of both migration and displacement. Uh, we at UNHCR see migration as pre predominantly voluntary movements where people still have a choice, whereas displacement is where, when they flee for survival. Um, and um, we can see that disasters in general, not necessarily linked to climate change, because the causality issue is sometimes hard to do. Um, uh, displaced persons in Asia mostly. Uh, this year, for example, uh, last year in 2016, China was the country where most people were displaced. Then the Philippines, uh, India, and comes at the fifth place, uh, the United States. So it doesn't only happen in countries that are the most vulnerable, but it also happened to uh, more developed countries. Uh, but the consequences are you know, a bit different because the governments in uh, more developed countries have capacities to protect and assist their citizens uh, more quickly uh, in, in, than, than other countries. So Asia is a region where in the past, which has been most at risk, if we look at past trends, it's difficult to predict for the future because it will of course depend on what governments do and how they act, how they act preventively with climate change adaptation and increasing resilience uh, and how they, how they protect their citizens before they also have to cross the border. But we can see, for example, in, uh, in Africa, like Lake Chad region, or in uh, Haiti, for example, these are regions, or the Pacific, these are regions that are extremely vulnerable to climate change, droughts or sea rise in the Pacific, where we can expect that in the future, if nothing change, uh, displacement of people because our linked to climate change will take place. Yes, um, this well, climate change is a threat multiplier. So it's not necessarily causing conflict or causing displacement, but it's uh, another layer of reasons increasing um, the, the increasing reason on the reasons why people move. So uh, people lose their livelihoods and they would not necessarily link it to climate change, but because their cattle died and you know, uh, they lose their livelihoods, etc. Uh, but if you ask them why, then they could link it to the drought. And yes, the drought has been more and more severe and frequent. And then you can see how climate change has this, is really these underlying factors. Um, and on, on conflict, it's kind of the same, you know, it's not, conflict does not happen because of climate change. Conflict is the responsibility of human beings. So, but climate change can influence also, you know, the conflict over scarce resources, uh, more, uh, more conflict over water and food, arable land, etc. Uh, that become scarcer and scarcer because of the effects of climate change. Like conflict that already exists becoming even more worse because of the effects of climate change. Yeah, I mean, it can, climate change can both create, I mean, create conflicts, not directly as I mentioned, uh, but also when there are already a crisis, a humanitarian crisis with conflict, uh, it's, it, it's not easy to resolve because, you know, humanitarian response is not uh, tailored to this kind of very complex and multi-causal um, crisis so you don't have just to respond to a conflict but also to all the causes of that conflict that are not only you know the uh, conflict between humans but also because they lack uh, the resources etc it exacerbates the tensions yes um, well it's so in some ways, you know, men are always the first one who migrates. Uh, they migrate just, you know, as, uh, well, as soon as they see their livelihoods opportunity diminishing, the family uh, rests at the 
home of origin and the men, usually the young men, are uh, migrating to find new economic opportunities and then they send their remittances back to home. So the women are like the most vulnerable to climate change and they are the ones that usually also get trapped in, in uh, situations where uh, climate change is really impoverishing them. So we can see there are two kind of uh, effects because, you know, like for sudden onset disasters, uh, everybody is affected uh, the same, but the response uh, to this displacement must, must be tailored to women, children and men. Uh, whereas for slow onsets, that's really, you know, the droughts, these onsets that are very long on the long term, then you can see where men are the, the ones that are moving uh, more, more in advance in time, but women are the women that are the ones that are trapped or that move at the very last minute for their survivals with the children and uh, that are really at risk. Yeah, absolutely. It's not only a possibility, but it's a duty, I would say, because you know, one, of course, mitigation, reducing the greenhouse gases is extremely important because otherwise climate change will continue. Uh, but climate change is already happening, so how can we help these people? And there's a lot states can do in prevention to displacement and climate change adaptation increase the resilience of populations. And it is proved that if the population is resilient, even if a disaster strikes, the population will not be affected the same. They will be less affected if they are more resilient. So it's an absolute necessity and it has to go hand in hand also with disaster risk reduction. And with strong climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction that include in their plans, you know, all these displacement and human mobility migration aspects, then we can, you know, really help the people before they are even displaced by climate change. Yeah, I mean, when there is no other option than to leave, usually what people do, they leave, but they stay within their country, you know, they, they do not necessarily cross a border. If they cross a border, they stay within the same region. Uh, and, you know, there's again a different bit, be different between those who have moved more or less voluntarily, but still have some resources or have some connections abroad with family or others. And those that are really moving at the last minute to survive. And this, it's important to distinguish because this last category, when they move, they are extremely vulnerable and they need assistance and protection. Uh, and that's what we are working on, that if they move, uh, if they are displaced, uh, they are provided in another country assistance and protection, at least temporary, through temporary protection and stay arrangements or through humanitarian visas. Um, and in the context of people who move more voluntarily, like migration, yes, it's extremely important that there are encouragements for migration and dignity. Uh, and I think Kiribati has uh, a, a national law on migration and dignity. And what they are doing is quite interesting. They are supporting their own citizens. Um, they are giving them trainings, etc., so that the, the citizens are skilled. And when they go abroad, they are competitive on the job market. So it's a way a state can help his own citizens moving abroad in dignity with everything, the resources and the skills uh, that are, the citizen will need in its future life. Yes, uh, there was progress, <laughs> so that's the good news. So it's the Paris Agreement provides for the creation of the task force in paragraph 49, and the task force was now established, and the task force, UNHCR is part of this, that task force, and uh, the task force met in May this year and uh, adopted its work plan to ensure that the task force delivers recommendations by COP24 next year, uh, recommendations on integrated approaches to avert, minimize and address displacement. So this is well underway, you know, like uh, every member of the task force has different responsibilities in the work plan and 
and it's uh, it's gonna be you know it's 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 in course of implementation to ensure uh, the recommendations are delivered on time as mandated by the Paris Agreement. So UNHCR has uh, three recommendations around uh, the um, three priorities for this COP. Uh, the facilitative dialogue is a dialogue that will take place next year um, and has started uh, already and is, is discussed here at COP23 that will assess how states are do all parties are doing in uh, implementing their commitments and in their ambition of reducing greenhouse gas emission. And for us, UNHCR and other partners, we think it shouldn't only be, a, be about, about mitigation, it should also be about impacts. If they fail in reducing their emissions, what are the impacts on populations and displacement uh, and migration? And so we are really encouraging states to also look at this issue when they do this facilitative dialogue. The other priority is a Paris Agreement implementation. And for us, I mean, the task force on displacement is quite high on this agenda. And uh, it's well underway, but it's very important also to ensure that a civil society outside this task force like people really affected by climate change and already displaced are also able to contribute to the recommendations. And the third one um, is uh, the NDCs, uh, so nationally determined contributions that states are um, going to, to do, uh, uh, have committed to do in the Paris Agreement. And next year, I think, um, the end of next year, they will review, revise their NDCs. So it will be really important again that in, in these nationally determined contributions, they look at the issue of human mobility and what they are doing to uh, prevent displacement and do what protection mechanism they have in place to protect people when they are displaced or to en encourage migration and dignity. So that's uh, our priorities.